Herzlich willkommen zum Release Fitness Podcast. Ich bin dein Gastgeber Patrick Meinert. Mein heutiger Interviewpartner ist Dr. Nathan Kaiser aus den Vereinigten Staaten, aus Michigan. Und ich habe mir mit ihm das Thema Post-Concussion-Symptoms ausgesucht. Das liegt daran, dass Dr. Kaiser ein funktioneller Neurologe ist, beziehungsweise ein Chiropraktiker mit der Spezialisierung auf funktionelle Neurologie. Und er betreut verschiedene Personen, in Bezug auf Gehirnschütterung. Also er behandelt hauptsächlich Personen, die unter einer Gehirnschütterung leiden. Und man bezeichnet auch die Symptome, die die Person nach einer Gehirnschütterung von sich getragen haben, als Post-Concussion-Symptoms. Und darauf wird auch unser heutiger Fokus bei diesem Gespräch liegen. Es ist in der Tat mein erstes englischsprachiges Interview. Und ich muss tatsächlich zugeben, wenn man längere Zeit kein Englisch mehr spricht, dann ja, <lacht> bekommt man nicht nur Wortfindungsstörungen, sondern man fängt auch etwas an zu stottern. Also wenn ich hier und da ein paar geistige, kognitive Aussätze habe, dann verzeih es mir. Ansonsten hat mich das Gespräch selber sehr, sehr fasziniert. Und ich bin sehr, sehr dankbar, dass sich Dr. Kaiser die Zeit genommen hat. Ich werde auf jeden Fall einige Informationen über ihn noch in die Show Notes reinpacken und ansonsten eine kleine Werbung noch in eigener Sache. Am 18. Juli findet der Tagesworkshop Brain First statt. Dieser wird zum einen live in der Release Fitness Academy stattfinden, zu dem du Zugang bekommen kannst. Du hast aber auch die Möglichkeit, den Tagesworkshop auch als Livestream zu verfolgen. Also du musst nicht vor Ort sein. Du kannst den also auch von zu Hause aus dir anschauen und in diesem Tagesworkshop zeige ich auf, was es mit der funktionellen Neurologie auf sich hat, wie du das selber für dich als Trainer, Coach, Therapeut nutzen kannst. So, ohne jetzt weiter drum herum zu reden, wünsche ich dir sehr, sehr viel Spaß beim kommenden Podcast mit Dr. Nathan Kaiser. Hi guys, welcome to the Release Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Meinert, and today I am happy to have Dr. Kaiser on the show. Dr. Kaiser is a chiropractic neurologist specialized on concussion rehabilitation with his clinic in Michigan. He is board certified as a diplomat by the American Board of Chiropractic Neurology, and he is also an assistant professor of clinical neurology for the Carrick Institute. Is there anything else you want the listeners to know about you? Did I miss something important? No, I mean, the all of it is kind of with the goal of trying to help people that are in kind of in that tough spot with brain injury, specifically kind of post-concussion syndromes and, and what we see with dysautonomia and some of the things that come with that. So it's all just to try to help folks feel better. Okay. So as I know, so you're not just working with athletes, but you also like working with everyday people like weekend warriors. So you have like different clients coming into your clinic. So most of my listeners are like doing a lot of sports. The most of them are athletes. Mm -hmm. So I would love to focus a little bit more on sports related concussion. Sure. Um, what are the symptoms you have to deal with most of your athletes when it comes to us concussion symptoms? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for them to kind of seek out treatment, there's a certain type of patient versus people that maybe just kind of try to push through and continue to play, right? So the ones that tend to, to impact return to play are people dealing with headaches, dizziness is a big one, vision problems, just kind of not feeling like they can't. I mean, you know what it is to be a tuned athlete and not be able to, to kind of do the thing you're used to be doing. That's a big one we see quite a bit. And then problems with, you know, getting dizzy when you stand up, feeling irritable, feeling anxious, depressed. Those are kind of the big ones that'll bring people in to seek help. Okay. So do you think that there's not just like, how to say like, because I think that for an athlete, maybe especially difficult because returning to play is something like it could make your symptoms worse. So in this moment, when you start again with training and like with the movements you did before, that maybe you're, it, there will be something like a flare up of your symptoms. So do you think this is something what is especially for athletes a little bit complicated, like for returning to sports? Yeah, it's actually a way more complex question than we kind of consider at times because you also got, so you've got 
the trepidation, like the worry about, is this going to hurt me more? Am I going to lose my spot? You know, is somebody else going to come in and take my spot on the roster? That's a big one. But then as you, so we know with concussion, there are specific things that has to have to happen in the brain in order to heal, but they also make it harder to, to exercise and to do things normally. Um, some interesting things we know are that people that have long-term symptoms that last over two months, over 70% of those people actually have problems with dysautonomia or their ability to regulate blood flow throughout their body, but specifically to their brain. So when we look at exercise parameters, how do we reintroduce exercise? How do we reintroduce skilled activity? That plays a huge role. We want to make sure that um, we can adequately return blood flow to the head. As you know, before we can train, if, if you were going to train someone on you know, just running a hundred meter dash, you wouldn't want to have them hold their breath for a half hour beforehand and then try to hold their breath while they're running, right? They can't get oxygen to the system. It's going to be harder for them to run. So we think about the same things in terms of a brain. If we're not able to adequately deliver blood flow to the cells that we're trying to help, we're not going to have a good outcome in those cells. We can actually create an injury. So we really focus on there are three parts of circulation in your brain when we have a concussion. So the first thing that happens is we have neurovascular coupling changes. So if you think about every time a neuron fires in your brain, there should be a blood vessel that comes right along next to it and feeds it the blood that it needs to survive to be able to do that activity. And it's beautiful. So they're, they're married. Every time you have an activity in a neuron, blood vessel can bring oxygen to it. But when we have a concussion, we see that that is specifically interrupted so that we can decrease pressure loads on the area so that we can start so we can decrease activation of it so that we don't further injure the tissue but as people heal and start to come back we have to be able to recouple that neurovascular system so that when you have a neuron fire that the blood vessel can still supply it so that's a big part of return the second thing we are really interested in is called cerebral autoregulation. And that's just basically, so like if you're, if you're doing a deadlift or if you're doing a sprint, you want the blood pressure in your head to always be the same, regardless of if you're resting or if you're doing like a PR deadlift, right? So, cause if you have too much pressure in your head, you know, we don't have good things. We, it's locked inside your skull. So you have a system called your autoregulation system that helps you to keep that blood pressure the same. But what we find is that gets interrupted in concussion. So sometimes when somebody lays down and they stand up, they feel dizzy, or if they start to exercise again, they feel a lot of pressure in their head. So we wanna do things to help them be able to regain that function of the autoregulatory system. And then the last thing is with cerebral vasoreactivity. So the blood vessels themselves are sensitive to oxygen. Sometimes when we have hyperventilation or people breathe too much, they breathe through their mouth, then we see, or we see with anxieties, they actually the increase in oxygen in the system causes a constriction of the blood vessels within the brain. So we want to do things to slow their breathing down, allow them to actually create carbon dioxide buffer so that we can increase vasodilation in the system. So we might have somebody do a breathing exercise prior to doing a brain exercise so that we can shunt blood flow so we can cause blood flow to happen in that area and then be able to stimulate it after that. So when it comes back around to thinking about returning to play and exercise, we want to be able to activate the specific part of the brain we're aiming for but we want to do it in an environment where we know it can grow. Just like you want to be recovered as an athlete before you train, you want to be recovered or have adequate you know, blood flow environment, oxygen to be able to stimulate that neuron so it'll grow. Okay, I see. So if there is like a greater oxygen demand, so it seems to be like an energy crisis, or like you have metabolic deficient a little bit. So are there like something like basic recommendation because you said that there might be specific areas with less of oxygen supply, maybe less of perfusion. So are there like specific recommendations to fuel up the whole brain? You said before, like maybe the, the correct breathing exercises. Yeah. So we look at it in two ways. There's like a whole brain and then there's every time you activate a specific area. So like if I want to move my left hand, there's a very specific part in the right side of my brain in the frontal lobe that activates for that. But if that part can't get oxygen correctly, then I'm not going to be able to control this part of my hand as long or as hard as I want to. So for like whole brain things, we want to make sure that people have good blood flow regulation in their head. We do different things with, we had talked a little bit about heart rate regulation during exercise, making sure we don't exceed certain heart rates so that we don't cause too much pressure. Simple way to do that. If you've got people on your podcast that are trainers, they may have done what's called a ventilatory threshold test. 
at some point where it's a pretty simple test where you just have someone exercise and you bring their heart rate up five beats per minute at a time. And what you're doing is making sure that they can still speak while they're exercising. So once they start to struggle with speech, then we know that their breathing rate is becoming tied to breathing off carbon dioxide versus their breathing rate to bring in oxygen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we keep them at a rate where they're breathing in to be able to maintain oxygen and not to blow off carbon dioxide, then we're going to be able to regulate that blood flow diameter. We're going to cause kind of maximal dilation in the brain versus causing an ischemic response where we cause constriction. So when we bring them back, we start off making sure that they can talk throughout their exercise period. As soon as they start to struggle with conversation and being able to speak, then we mark that level where the heart rate is. And we don't have them exceed that. So we say, okay, it's 135 or 120 or 115 or whatever the heart rate is. And then we exercise them there. Not because that's the best way to get fitness, but it's because it's the best way to make sure that you're going to exercise without decreasing blood flow in your brain. So that's kind of one good one. And then you asked about breathing. Another good one with breathing is to dry, try to breathe as much through your nose as you can. And with it, keeping your mouth closed. It's going to increase nitric oxide release, which is really handy because it dilates blood vessels. It's going to slow down oxygen consumption, which is going to increase CO2 load in your brain, which is going to dilate blood vessels. So trying to breathe slowly and trying to breathe through your nose. That's a little tricky because you get air hunger where you feel like you got to breathe. You kind of want to swim like right next to that line of air hunger, but so that it doesn't go too far where you like start to panic. Is that yeah, okay. So would you recommend maybe like trying to do some air hunger drills? Like maybe here, Patrick McCowan from the Oxygen Advantages is also saying the nose is for breathing and the mouth is for eating. So <laughs> it's easy to remember. Yeah, um, that's good. I like that. Yeah. So would you recommend also like trying to uncouple it like from the sporting events? So maybe in a seated or lying position, just starting with breath holds and then combine it with sports activity? Yeah, I think it's a great tool, especially as long as you're not creating too much like if an anxiety demand, if that's the type of person that you're working with. Yeah, I think it's a super great exercise and especially to break them apart at first. So you're just kind of getting the feel for what that breathing is like before you start bringing it into athletic function. Well, I think it's a great tool probably for people, not just in the concussion world, but in other training worlds as well. Just bringing that resilience to oxygen, mm. uh, CO2 tolerance. I like that. That's very good. Yeah. Okay. So I think if you have like a general energy crisis in the brain, as you said, so we can do maybe some breathing exercises. But if I have a specific area, as you said before, a specific area in the motor cortex, like controlling maybe left, as you said, right side is for the uh, the right side of the brain is for the left side of the body and the other way around. So if there is a specific area, how would you examine it? Because I, I think it it seems to be pretty difficult to examine like a specific area when it's just about perfusion and oxygen supply. I know that Dr. Amen is doing like using the SPECT scan, mm -hmm. but it seems to be a little bit difficult always to scan the brain and check for oxygen and fuel, I guess. That's a really good question. So to start off with Dr. Amen, what they do with the SPECT is brilliant. But it's hard to do, and it's hard to get access to a spec scan easily, and it's hard to run a pre and post spec scan. It's expensive. But what we do is, you're right, where you can start to find specific areas is really where the rubber meets the road. That's where it makes a big difference with rehab. So when you look at general strategies versus specific strategies, specific strategies are infinitely better. There are some different things we think about with activity-induced neuroplasticity versus when we look at just spontaneous recovery neuroplasticity. And we see enriched environments, specific environments have much greater impact on cortical mapping, on different morphologies that happen. So, so a couple cool things when we think about, you asked a couple questions there, with one how to diagnose it is we really look at sensory motor activity. Like there's a, as humans, we all have general things that we do that are kind of the same. So we can look at how people move, whether it's moving their eyes, whether it's how they balance, whether it's how they move their arms or how they walk or how they what happens when they turn their head or how their heart beats. All those different things help build together a picture of what that person looks like. So if we can understand that picture and see where there's breakdowns in those functions, then we can trace them back to the areas of the brain that would control those functions. So if my left hand moves to kind of stick with that reference, if I, if I can't touch my nose accurately, I miss my nose, then I know that there's a problem with the parts of my brain that would understand where my hand is and then how to then make it go to my nose. So I would think about areas in the same side of the cerebellum. How does that integrate with the, the sensory cortex about knowing where my hand is on the other side? How does that feed forward into the motor cortex with how to move it? Do they 
plan with the supplementary cortex? Are we able to do them in the right sequence? So you start to look at these pathways like a river and you're saying where along the pathway is it failing? And then we know where we can intervene and start to, to work on that specific action. So that's really where the good stuff is. And what's interesting, we talked about neurovascular coupling, which is the idea that every little spot in the brain has its own vascular supply. What's really interesting is they did a study where they said, okay, we can probably improve neurovascular coupling if we go ahead and if we just like choke them. So if we choke somebody, if we take away their oxygen, that should increase the carbon that should pop that neurovascular activity back in doesn't work. They say, okay, well, what if we take glucose out, right? Those are the two things that we need to be able to fuel a cell. Same thing. It doesn't change neurovascular coupling. The one thing that does change it, which is super, super cool, is activation of the somatosensory map. So by using, by creating a sensory barrage in that area, so again, if it's my left hand, by using that left hand, by creating activity in that left hand, that's actually the one thing that will recouple that neurovascular system. So if we take an approach where we're just doing general concussion rehab, I'm on the treadmill walking, you know, doing my thing, I'm doing nothing to address this hand. So when I go back to activity, I'm more likely to have an injury, I'm more likely to, to sprain my wrist or hurt my shoulder because I don't have adequate control. I don't have normal perfusion in that area. And this is why we see there's a huge, there's a high incidence reported with ACL tears after concussion. There's a high incidence of ankle injury after concussion. So we see these happen quite a bit. So we want to be able to identify where are the weak spots. So rather than just trying to perfuse the whole brain, how do we improve functionality? How do we optimize function in areas that aren't quite working well because we know the impact that that's going to have on the brain. So taking kind of that brain-centric approach. Mm, okay. Wow, that's great. So it could be useful to stimulate the areas before movement. So to keep your example, like with the left hand. So before like doing some workouts or like maybe some throwing or something else, it might be useful to work on the parietal lobe during some vibration, um, deep touch, like proprioceptive input. So everything what is possible to stimulate the central system and then go on with some movement, doing it as a warm up or something like this. That's exactly right. So to give an example, yesterday we had somebody that had had a problem, was noticing that when they would be in like a tandem stance doing yoga, they kept falling over to the right. So we were able to identify that activities where she turned her head to the right exacerbated it. When she would do things like holding something in her right hand, she was more stable. So we were able to localize that that right side of the cerebellum wasn't integrating appropriately. And a lot of it had to do with kinematics in her neck. So we were able to do things where we just taught her how to slowly engage those segments in her neck and then do some movements in her hand. And she's able to do that prior to her yoga. So it's almost like a warm up where we're activating that portion of the brain first. We're creating stability in it so that we know that the metabolic demand is being met. We know that the activity is good. And then we push it further. Then we ask it to do something more integrated, more complex. Um, mm -hmm. So we think about it and I think about it in three ways. So we think about it in isolation. So we want to take the area that's not working well and we want to isolate it down to its smallest form so that we can make that work correctly again. And once we've created the isolation, then we want to integrate it back into the normal structure of kind of this holistic body that works. So if it's my neck, maybe I'm working on this one segment here in rotation, but then I also have to be able to turn my head and catch a ball, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last phase is where we look at, so we go from isolation, integration into improvisation, which is where we start to change the training environment. So we have a lab environment where we control all our variables, right? We say, okay, let's turn our head slow. And then we say, okay, turn your head and touch that wall over there. But then the last step is really taking it into the real world where we have to be able to respond to the environment around us, to be able to have predictability, to be able to play soccer or play basketball and be able to respond to an environment that we have no idea what's going on. So moving through those levels and then you know, back down through is kind of how we think about it to make sure we can translate mm -hmm. what we have in the lab to something that's going to serve people once they get back out trying to make money mm -hmm. in their sport. So. Okay. So if you're trying to work on isolation on different areas in the brain and maybe you get like a bad outcome. So is it also like possible looking on the neurological pathways and trying to activate some areas which are firing into the area where it's like an oxygen and a blood supply deficiency? Sure. So I think the way I understand you asking the question is you see something that you think is wrong and you do something to try to improve it and you go, shoot, that wasn't the right thing right? Exactly. Yes. Which is beautiful because it's a test because mm -hmm. it allows you to say, 
if I try to attack this area through this pathway, that doesn't work. I can't do that. So then, then I can say, okay, well, what about this one over here? Or what about this one over here? So by recognizing it, by being able to observe, was that good or was it bad is brilliant because you're not just doing something, hoping it's going to work. You're going to say, we're going to do this thing. And if it doesn't work, then we know it doesn't work. And we know we need to address it in a different way. So it really allows you to, to just kind of push through your options to be able to figure out what is going to be the way for the person in front of me. And then you're not running an algorithm like every time I, you know, I see this, I do this thing because it just doesn't work that way. So I think what you're describing is the way that it should be done. Mm-hmm. You test, you see if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, then you do something different. You don't just try to keep doing the thing and hoping that it will one day work. Mm, okay. So you mentioned that this example, like turning the head to the right side and then like having some uh, stability issues. So I guess like one of the common post-concussion symptoms are like cervicogenic problems, like neck and head related problems, like neck issues. Yep. So would you also use vestibular or vision work if you have like some neck issues or how do you see Uh, the vestibular system, the neck, and the visual system related to each other when it yeah. comes to PCS? And specifically in terms of PCS, so there are kind of two questions there because one, a lot of times when people hurt their head, there's a consequence of neck injury that goes with it as well. So a lot of people that have post-concussion syndrome also have neck injuries. So we have this loop of making sure that we aren't getting faulty signaling from our neck, from the proprioceptive system in our neck from an injury, because that's going to tie in with what we see with the visual and vestibular sim- systems, right? So if I have an injury in my neck, it's going to affect the tonus of my neck muscles, which is going to affect the orientation of my eyes, which is going to affect the feedback of my vestibular system. They all work together. We talk about it with patients, Your the proprioceptors in your neck, the information from your eyes and from your inner ear are kind of like your wrist, your elbow and your shoulder. When you're thinking about throwing a ball, you have to have all three. You can't just throw with your shoulder and you can't just throw with your wrist. They all work together. So in terms of that sensory information that comes in, your eyes give you information about where your head is and what's going on around you. Your inner ear gives you information about where your head is and your neck gives you information about where your head is. And together, they create a picture that's projected into your parietal lobe. That So we have all these integrating factors that go in. So if we have a conflict you've got neck information that's different from your inner ear or that's different from your eyes. We have a problem to solve in our brain, which is going to slow things down. It takes processing power away. It's going to cause errors in the way that we move. It's going to cause errors in the way that we feel the world around us. So we're more likely to get dizzy. We're more likely to have blurred vision because we've got a conflict between the things that tell us where we should be. So evaluating the vestibular system is super important in post-concussion syndromes. Evaluating oculomotor activity, you know, we do these things on a really fine scale where we do, we run a full vestibular lab down to calorics and looking at this video oculography where we watch how people's eyes move to targets and we measure them. We watch how they respond to full field movement. We see how they move in the dark. You know, we put them on balance platforms and see where they fall and deviate with different head movements. We look at cervical position error, what happens when I close my eyes and have to control my head. So we look at all these things together and then we consider how they work both individually, but then how are they influencing the overall delivery system? And it's my opinion and it's the opinion of kind of the consensus of people working in the field that you have to address them all together. They don't really operate independently. So if I've got a problem with blurred vision or a problem with my eyes, I'm likely going to have to address that through mechanisms of the reflexes of my inner ear to be able to stabilize oculomotor activity. I'm going to have to integrate that with how I move my head. And if I've got a neck injury that's caused torsion in my neck, I've got to address that or I've got to address the vestibular system that's causing it to be able to, to kind of get the whole thing working together. And I see you guys are, are thinking about that in a big way. And I think, I think that's what you have to do. Otherwise, we end up creating dominance within one system. So you become a visually dominant person and then something happens and you got to get glasses and the whole thing falls apart again. Or you become a somatosensory dominant person and then you go into a sedentary life after your sport and all of a sudden you start having problems again. So they all work together. They're all one system. So to think about them as separate pieces is probably a disservice. 
Yeah, but I think this is what most of therapists, physiotherapists, especially in Germany or in Europe are doing, like just focus on like one system, maybe just focusing on the neck, just focusing on the vestibular system, and maybe a few of them focusing also like on vision. But usually vision is for most of the people just about accuracy and that's it. That's So if you go to an optometrist, and uh, there's not assessed a lot of uh, visual performance uh, beside or the a visual clarity that's, that's right. it yeah and so i think yeah i think this is this is like difficult to address everything together as you said yeah well i mean you have to so i mean as you know when i turn my head i may have that's my window into what's happening with my eyes right do they do the thing that they're supposed to do is my vision different when i'm looking straight ahead than it is when i tip my head in a direction am i am are they doing the things they're supposed to do so there it's all one window we see a lot of work with corrective lenses even using prisms and things like that which i think are beautiful tools and and have a great place in our healthcare system but there's no doubt i saw someone just last week that when they jump when they saccade to a target their eyes stay in phase. But when they follow something in the same direction, one eye drifts higher and creates a hypertropia. So when that happens and you're wearing a prism, when you look over, when you follow something this way, it's going to skew the vision. But when you jump over there, it's not. So that corrective lens is not going to help and it drives people mad. So being able to recognize those little subtleties and to be able to, to work on them, right? Mm-hmm. So, so if I'm having a problem with a pursuit in this direction, but the saccade is okay, just doing the saccade over and over and over again isn't going to address the same areas in the pursuit. They're in different parts of the brain. But by using you know, a vestibular tool where I can drive the eye over using the retina and pairing it with a vestibular activation, now I'm using the vestibular system to drive into that parietal lobe so that I can reset the gain of those, of those sensors. So, so those types of things, they're very subtle, but, but they make all the difference. Mm -hmm. So in your example of uh, hypertropia, so in this case, I I can imagine you have to focus like maybe the extraocular muscles on brainstem activation, so on the cranial nerves, but also like on the parietal lobe. So there are different areas we have to to, to address. So Mm -hmm. it's not just about the eye movement, like the muscles, but also like all the areas who are going into it. Right. What is the motor program that causes it, right? So. Mm -hmm. For my eyes to end up over here like this, I can use a fast eye movement, which is a saccade where I jump to it. And that's generated from the frontal lobe on the opposite side, right? But if I'm tracking an object and I end up in that same position over here, that actually is associated with pathways that are more from my parietal lobe and being able to know where I am in space. So these are two different things. So if I'm tracking something and all of a sudden my eyes jump over here, then I know that there's more likely an error in this pathway. But if my eyes still go over there, like if if I can jump, then I know the muscles are intact. I know the brainstem nuclei are intact. It's a higher portion of how I'm trying to use that muscle that's becoming a problem. So I can hold my gaze there if I can jump there, but I can't follow something there. Then I know it's not the muscle because it can get there in other ways, but it's likely the following something there that's a problem. So then you're going to go into that pathway and not worry so much about the cranial nerve. You know, it's intact because the eye can go there. Mm -hmm. The nucleus is intact because the eye can go there. It's higher. It's what's happening. And that sort of thing's super helpful. Otherwise, you just end up holding your eyes there, getting the muscle real strong. But then when you go to do the thing, it's that pathway that's broken down and ah, then you can't get it. So, Okay. So it seems to be like the vision training is pretty important for post-concussion rehabilitation. So what would you recommend? Are there like specific exercises or do you just recommend like exercises after you, you did a neurological examination? I don't like doing things generally for the same reason I talked about with missing the hand. We, we, we tend to create injuries. So I think from a practitioner standpoint, getting good at, at observing and recognizing those subtle cues, you know, getting good at seeing what happens with the eyes, getting good at understanding what's going on with the vestibular system. How does that translate? Is it different when they sit? Is it different when they stand? And to be able to add to that toolbox and to be able to understand more about deviations from normal, if you can understand what is normal versus what is not, then it gives you a better window to be able to create an application. And it really teaches. So I got to work with my mentor, Dr. Frederick Carrick, for a number of years. And the, one of the best things that I learned in working with him is learning what not to do, is learning, you know, when I have this one thing that's failing, in my mind, there may be a, a list of 10 things that we that we could potentially do, but there's probably only one thing that we should do. So being able to observe more accurately gives us the ability 
to be able to hone in our treatment more perfectly. And the more perfectly I can use it, again, we coming back to that beginning part we talked about, the more accurate my blood flow representation is going to be, the more accurate my map is going to be, the better signal I have to convert that into other tasks. If I have, if I'm generally doing something and the best I can do is doing it kind of 50%, that 50% is going to be translated into everything else that that pathway relies on. So if when I turn my head, I've got these jerks in my head movement, that translates into everything. It translates into what happens when I turn my head to go open the refrigerator. It happens when I'm looking down at my computer, whatever the thing is, everything is built on those simple foundations. So the better we are at understanding those little subtle subtleties in the foundation, those go into more and more complicated things. You know, we can't, if you take a lot of energy to do simple tasks, if the simple tasks aren't accurate, then you can't have accuracy in the complex tasks that they're built on. So that's super important. And visual system is a big part of that. Vestibular system is a big part of that. But then just how they all connect together. So if I can move my eyes here and hold them when I'm just sta- sitting here, but then as soon as I turn my head or as soon as I have to think that breaks down, or as soon as you know, I have to do something with my hand that breaks down, then it allows me to be able to see a little more depth on, on what's happening in that that person. Like, how is that? That person's not going to fit the textbook every time because there's no textbook for that one person. So you, you've got to kind of build it in your mind as you're going. And I think that makes a big difference. People that go and they, they check the boxes and we did all the things we're supposed to do for vestibular rehab versus observing that person and seeing what that person shows you every time and not phoning it in. So I think as a practitioner, mm-hmm. you appreciate that where the more attention you can pay and the more subtleties you pick up, the, the better you tend to do for people. Mm, I see. I like the idea about what not to do. So this means that you could also like something with simple exercises worse, having a, like a flare up of the system, the symptoms. Maybe for someone who doesn't have any post concussion symptoms, like different eye exercises like smooth pursuits and different kind of saccades wouldn't be any problem. But if you have like specific brain areas, which are not functioning well, you could also like doing it worse with just any kind of exercise. So this is why you have to address it in an individual manner, I guess. Yeah, this is what you're saying. Patrick, I think we're in lockstep here. That's exactly what I would say. I love that. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Okay, yeah, that's great. Okay, so maybe we can skip to another topic, more like a psychological perspective. Sure. Because I'm not sure if I remembered correctly, but I might remember that Dr. Carrick once said that if you have like a concussion, there will be also like you will be something in a depressed state. I don't know if it's always like this, but the longer the symptoms are after a concussion, I guess the more there is a chance of uh, being depressed afterwards. So do you deal also with uh, clients who are in a depressed state after the concussion? Yeah. And that, you know, Dr. Carrick said that a lot of times in a lot of different ways. If you think about it, just from a behavioral standpoint, that life-changing portion, I mean, we'll talk about it in two ways, the, that, you know, you're going along in your life and then all of a sudden it changes completely can cause a depressed mood. It changes you are, your activity levels, all those things can put you in a depressed mood, which is totally reasonable. But then when we look at changes in sensory motor integration, problems with concussion. We know that a huge percentage of those people, almost everyone, have problems that ultimately affect the areas in the prefrontal cortex. And those areas in the prefrontal cortex are associated with depression. So we know the longer that those symptoms, the longer those those malfunctions go on, the more likely we are to fall in that depressed state. So nearly everyone that has prolonged symptoms, like Dr. Kerrick said, is going to fall into that. So it's a big part of the way we think about it. We talk about it in ways where we're you know, trying to understand the difference between underlying mood disorders that may have been there, things that they may have been dealing with before versus things that seem to be new from a concussion. And we want to target things that allow us to be able to to get that prefrontal cortex to operate like we'd like it to again. So thinking about how do we affect that through the lens of this person is super important. So those two parts, there's one is behavioral, like, is it reasonable that you feel down if you can't go and it's your senior season in baseball and you can't play? Most people are kind of bummed about that. If you have an underlying mood disorder that, you know, you got diagnosed with depression when you were younger and it's good, this has made it worse, then we, we want to address that in a way that, that makes sense as well. But yeah, I think, would tell me about, I mean, I'm sure in your experience, you've noticed that that's kind of where a lot of people come from is where they're just taking on some of that depressed activity, mm. just with decreased brain function, right? 
Yes. So I think that beside of the behavior, as you said, there's, I think, like if your life is completely changing, you're not able to deal with your everyday life as you did before. This will for sure change your mood, your behavior. So I, I see it. I try also to see it like in the manner you said about the neurovascular coupling or like the changes in the neurovascular system, that if there is like an energy crisis and reduced supply of oxygen, of glycogen, I think there will be also like a change in the neurons, like in the activation potential, for example. This may lead to, how can I explain it, that the activation, the, the steady state is like higher. So the activation state, I don't know how is it called in English, but yeah. uh, you know what I mean, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and this may also like cause not only like reduced oxygen supply, but also like reduced ATP. And this lead maybe to more oxidative stress and this will cause inflammation. And after that, or during the, the state of uh, more inflammation in the brain, there will be also like something like a depressive state. And you don't know what was uh, first. Was it just depression or was it inflammation or is one causing the other? So it's, I think it's very difficult to say that. Yeah, I think you're on point there. But it's interesting to think about it in terms of that frontal cortex is kind of taking everything into account. Your whole sensory system takes into account your motivations, your goals, your current state of arousal, your current state of motivation. And it takes that whole picture and projects a, an idea of what we're going to do next, right? What is the thing that we're going to do in the next moment of our life and keep going? So if there's errors in any of that information that's coming in, we have the probability of causing kind of a diasthetic or where we're we're just not fully charging that battery, so to speak, of our frontal system. And if we're not able to do that and we can't bring it to threshold, then we see that kind of drop in activity. So you can, like you talked about, over time as that continues to go, we just create a continual energy demand. There's friction in the system. And if it's not addressed, it just makes it harder and harder to work. We see lethargy, fatigue, those things start to come in. We talk about brain fog, just all of those things that we're used to working so crisply, it's, there's just like static in that signal and that static in the signal causes that difficulty and be able to create activity. So over time, yeah, we think about inflammation, we think about, you know, all of just the, the stress that that puts on the system. But then if we go back to what we talked about before, then we think about all of those little sensory demands and motor demands that if we improve them, it increases that signal, it, it smooths that signal coming into the frontal lobe so that we kind of regain activity. So I think what you're talking about is really hopeful for people because a lot of them feel that way. If you've been dealing with this, you start to feel down. But if you recognize like, man, I know there's things that aren't working very well in my brain. While, you know, I may feel depressed, there's an opportunity to to create a solution, which I think is super cool for people that are that are in that world. It gives you hope to be able to say, okay, well, if I can address these problems I'm having, there's a likelihood that I can feel better too, not just uh, operate better. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, you also mentioned dysautonomia. So if I understood you correctly, it would be like maybe a solution or recommendation to work on the frontal lobe and on the parietal lobe to have like something like a, a top-down approach, like working on the frontal lobe, parietal lobe to, to stimulate the brainstem and to improve the regulation of your autonomic processes. So would you also recommend like doing something like this if there is like some form of dysautonomia? Yeah, for sure. So you think about like every process in your body has to be connected to the autonomic system because that's how it gets fed, right? So if it's mm. in order to get blood supply, in order to get glucose and oxygen, you've got to be able to have some sort of a feedback connection within the autonomic system so that, you know, when you're working, you can get fuel. So that top-down approach is really important for a couple of reasons. One, when you have injuries within the brain, the actual system within the, of sending blood flow through your brain changes, like we talked about with, with coupling and with vasoreactivity. But it also is the one, number one modulator of autonomic output. We rely on information from our hypothalamus, which relies on information from our frontal lobe to be able to send that, that descending activity to control brainstem activation. So myself, colleagues, folks like you, we're always thinking about how do we improve that descending activity, that information that comes down through those, the cortical reticular system or the cortical reticulospinal system that comes down and ultimately controls sympathetic activity. The other thing to think about is when there's any inefficiency in the system, we're going to bleed energy. 
we're going to be wasting energy on things that we normally wouldn't waste energy on. So there are kind of two, there's, there's that focal approach where we're looking at, is there pathways within that cortical reticulospinal system that are failing, causing decreased capacity within the autonomic system? It just can't operate as well. Or are we dealing with global functionality where I'm, I'm having so much energy being spent in crisis on kind of solving simple problems that I'm not able to output that energy into more complex things. So looking at it through those two windows helps you understand kind of the global of it, like the overall battery usage. Is there a certain app in your system that's not operating the way you'd like it to that's causing changes through the whole system? But like you said, either way, both lend to kind of a top-down approach of understanding how is this brain affecting my autonomic system versus just trying to habituate the autonomic system, just trying to, to give different compensation maneuvers. So you may be familiar with putting on compression stockings or drinking extra water or taking an extra salt. Those are just ways to compensate for a system that doesn't work. It doesn't do anything to help necessarily fix it. So I think, I think you're in the business of how do we solve the problem? So I think you're right. Yeah, for example, like if you are in a state of excessive uh, glutamate production in the brain with mm -hmm. less GABA, most of the people are like consuming a lot of carbs because it's like helps producing GABA or it uh, simulates uh, GABA for the brain. And this is also like uh, working on the sy symptoms, but not on the causes of too much, too excessive glutamate in your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, example. and exactly right. And, and in a lot of cases, like early on, that's how it's there for a reason. There's a reason that we go into those phases because changing that excitability of the brain allows us to be able to slow down and recover a little bit. The problem becomes when it's left there, when it's not solved for, when the problem still persists, that's when we start to have some problems. So I think the model that we both embrace of, of looking at how to solve the underlying problem, I think holds water kind of whether it's acute or chronic throughout the phases. I think that becomes the North Star how do we approach this thing without getting sucked into all these other things that we could look at? How do we just focus on helping them operate better and turning that into something that's useful? Okay. But there's one topic I would love to look at. <laughs> one sure. more. Sure. Uh, you said, you talked about also like the waste of energy. And this made me think about nutrition. So in my opinion, like where I get the least amount of information after concussion is about nutrition. So in my opinion, like this topic, there is not as much information as I would love to have. What is your thought about nutrition dealing with a concussion? Nutrition is like, that's the one for humans, isn't it? So mm. we all situations, I think there are a lot of opinions. If I share mine, mine is kind of nutrition is one of those things across the board. That's one very personal for people. And it's also very much tied to your culture and it's very much tied to your ability to afford it. So all those things matter. So obviously in that context, I think the best way to take care of your nutrition for your brain is to do it before you ever have a concussion. It's kind of like um, if, you, if you're a gal who gets pregnant, the best time to, be, to get in shape for your pregnancy is not once you're already pregnant right? You're already in it. So if I could give any advice, it would be taking care of your, you know, eating a whole food diet that is, you know, well balanced and has all of the nutrient needs that you're not, not eating too much. Those are, it's a solid advice for everyone. But beyond that, once we look at things where you're already in an injured, that becomes tricky because you've got a lifetime of eating habits that go into it. So if you're looking at it from a purely nutritional standpoint, sometimes we like to do things that reduce activity in the brain so that we don't overstimulate maladaptive pathways. So for example, if we've started to generate abnormal movement patterns, if we're you know, in hyperkinetic states, we don't want to do things to continue to feed those neurons to make them stronger. Sometimes we want to decrease activation. These are things where you, you know, where ketogenic diets came into play with epileptic kids back in the early century. And we've created some application to those things currently. You know, people use different sorts of MCTs and things that are creating energy in the brain. But I think generally speaking, continuing to eat a low inflammatory food diet, including things like plenty of oils, plenty of omega-3 rich foods, decreasing omega-6 rich foods, things like that, things that don't cause inflammation don't eat a bunch of sugar. That's not the time mm. to like eat a bunch of Krispy Kreme donuts, right? It's the time to just pair back to normal solid principles within nutrition. 
I think there are some things that can be used therapeutically. They're very individual dependent. So like, do you have, are you pre-diabetic before you go in? Do you have problems? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what is your body type going in? So I usually shy away from giving specific or kind of giving general advice about specific things on diet, because that's the one, it seems to be the one thing that when you have a problem, it's the thing that we go to first to try to fix because it's the thing we can control the most. So I'm usually a little bit reticent to give advice on that because as soon as I say it, everybody will do it regardless if it's good for them or not. But I'm curious to hear hear what your thoughts are because I can tell you you put a lot of time into thinking about it. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so as I can see, nutrition diet is pretty important, mm -hmm. but it's difficult to manage. <laughs> this is what, what I'm getting out of what you are saying. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if there's like a strength coach in the United States. It's Paul Check. I don't know if you know him. So he's like not just doing strength thing. Strength coaching is also like doing holistic training. And he once said, if you are able to hold a knife and a fork from that moment on, you have an opinion about food and nutrition. That is a great yeah, way to so, put it. <laughs> yeah. So everyone has his own opinion and there are vegans, there are carnivores, there are omnivores. And also like when I'm reading stuff about brain food, so to say. So there are like different opinions. As you said, there are some scientists they are saying like maybe vegan is the best for your brain the others may be saying that a lot of meat consumption is better for the brain so there are really different opinions as you said it makes it all quite difficult so in my opinion so i'm trying to do it like as you said so like low inflammatory food nutrition maybe i'm working also like with supplementation so i would recommend directly after a concussion maybe to do work with magnesium so i'm a fan of supplementation so i think in this case of like energy crisis your brain needs a lot of magnesium for example magnesium threonate maybe and a little bit of creatine so also like to, to supply the brain with with energy and not just focus on carbs Maybe like something like a low carb diet would be good, but I'm not a fan of like a ketogenic diet. But as you said, if you're used to consume a lot of carbs and then you're going from a lot of carbs to a low carb or ketogenic diet, this could make like the symptoms work worse in my opinion, because you are pushing somewhere more into the energy crisis. And also, as you said, is your behavior you had before the concussion is pretty important because like changing all the things you are eating from one day to another, I think it's impossible to make this kind of a behavior change. So this is why I love to also use supplements because it's for the most of the people, it's quite easy to take supplements as an addition to what they are eating on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that's a responsible way to look at it. I think I'm, I'm generally aligned with most of those things. Yeah, I will say that we try not to... Diet can be a stressor. Mm. The idea of having to change amidst another change can sometimes be worse than any amount of good food that you can give someone. You know what I mean? If, this, if you eat McDonald's every day, but the stress it causes you to try to change your diet is worse than eating the McDonald's every day, then have you really created a victory for someone? I'm not sure about that. Now, it's not to say that I think everybody should eat McDonald's every day, but I think as practitioners, it's our responsibility to really be discerning about how we use nutrition because it is such a vital part of who we are. And as you said, there's so much conflicting data. So if you think about your veganism and carnivore debate, I think it seems like really good news that our brain can survive on both. Do you know what I mean? So the mm, truth yeah. So the truth is probably somewhere in between. So I think, as you said, making sure that we're kind of meeting people where they are and supporting them in that way is really helpful. We do know that your brain relies on glucose. I mean, that's the thing we don't have. Mm. If you're going to have, and this is maybe something that's worth talking about. So if you think about like a muscle, if you want to be ready at any time to just be able to sprint, right? Muscles can be a little bigger and they can afford to store up some glycogen, right? Your liver can store a little glycogen. But with the brain, there's so much efficiency. There's no, you. we've trimmed everything out. The brain can, is as small as it can be and it's as big as it can be at the same time. So it doesn't have room to store energy. It relies, mm -hmm. it, it basically says, it, we're going to make this bet. We're going to say, we're going to be as lean and mean as we can in the brain, which means you've got to get me oxygen and glucose all the time, but I'm not going to store it. So we're not going to create a store. So we have to be able, so when I think about it, I think more about the delivery system is more important than the substrate itself. Because if the delivery system fails, there's no backup. There is no contingency plan in the brain. It can't go with, it just, without the delivery system to bring oxygen, to bring glucose in, it runs out real fast. 
I mean, if someone is drowning in a pool, the first thing that's going to fail is your brain, right? So when you get out, you're drowned, but you survive, you have brain damage. So we just don't have super, super long. When I'm thinking about resources, generally blessed that most of us are consuming enough to be able to create some glucose. We breathe enough to be able to breathe in oxygen. I think from an intervention standpoint, like the place where we can make the most difference is in making sure the delivery system is able to respond appropriately, to make sure that all of the bells and whistles that allow us to understand the blood pressure in our head, to be able to constrict and dilate blood vessels, to be able to perfuse into arterioles and capillaries in the right amounts at the right time. I think that orchestration from if you're going to focus on something you can do for someone, how you can serve them, I think there is a disproportionate amount of gain that you have doing that compared to the other part. Does that make sense? Yes, sure. So I, I think that's where we can really like make a big difference. Whereas the other parts we're generally doing pretty good. Like just don't eat like an asshole and you'll be okay sometimes, you know, but generally as our point of entry, I think about if that delivery system fails, if our supply chain to the brain fails, then we're in way worse shape than if we ate a donut. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, this have been like best final words <laughs> for this podcast <laughs> interview. So it sums up everything in a pretty good way. So thank you for this. So if our listeners want to know a little bit more about yourself, uh, where do they have to look? Where do they get some information about yourself? Sure. I have a website. It's a kind of patient-centric website. It's drkaiser.com, D-R-K-E-I-S-E-R.com. We met through Instagram. So I'm Doc Kaiser on Instagram, and I try to share things there, mostly just practical things and practical ways of looking at science that are useful. I try not to make it too heavy, but things that like we can we can put to work. And then I have I did put if there are specific concussion folks out there, we have a like a five mistakes people with concussions make PDF that we built for people, mostly for COVID related things because it allows you to be able to to kind of take stock of what you're doing at home and see if there are things that you could do on your own independent of being able to come and see someone. So. So people are interested, they can check that out too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will mention it in the show notes. Oh, great. And you also told me before the interview that there will be also like a book available. Yeah, so we've, I finished the manuscript on a book. Pretty mm -hmm. excited about it. Super hard work to write a book, might I add. So I'm proud to be done with that. It goes to the editor in five days. So mm -hmm. sometime, hopefully in the next couple months, we'll have a book available and, and we'll we'll try to do our best to get that out to everyone too. It's about post-concussion syndrome and how do we look at practical science? How do we understand how to best do the things we talk about today to be able to, to find that specificity and to be able to create that positive neuroplasticity. So I'm really excited about to have that out to everyone. Okay, great. When will the book be available? That's a great question. When they say it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, during this year, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. It'll be 2020. Yeah, it'll be done. Either it'll be either late summer or early fall, probably will be the release. So okay. That's the great. word. Yeah. Yeah. I will read it for sure. Well, I will yes. get you a copy. I'd be happy to do that. I really appreciate your time and uh, okay, well, I appreciate would be great. So yeah, I appreciate your I, service to, to all the people <laughs> that are watching here. Cause I don't, I want to take a minute cause they are getting like your hard work and your thought and this stuff isn't easy for, for, for free. So it's super cool that to share your thoughts and continue to, to do that for people is brilliant. So thank you for doing that for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, for attending the show and thank you for your kind words. Uh, yes. Yeah, so hope to speak you soon again. Yeah. Let's stay in touch. Good to speak with you. Okay, thank you.